Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be with you in Madrid today. I'd like to thank Philippe for giving me the opportunity to present this afternoon. Here are my disclosures. When we think about the MRI and the pathway benefits it brings, we need to remember that most of the benefits arise from reducing the number of men undergoing a biopsy. And one of these, a benefit of these, includes reduced diagnoses of um, indolent disease. And for many men, there is a greater precision of tumor grade and volume determination. But you'll notice it's only number four that we increase the detection of clinically significant disease. This is particularly the case in prior negative biopsy men. So in a mixed outpatient cohort of patients with the prevalence of clinically significant disease in 30%, if you were to do a systematic biopsy, you would miss 111 patients. And 700 men would be diagnosed as either having benign or insignificant cancers, but all 700 men would need a biopsy before declaring them as either being benign or, or with indolent disease. On the other hand, if you were to do an MRI scan, you would miss fewer cancers. You'll see 84, but only 600 and but only 28 men would need a biopsy to confirm the absence of cancer. In other words, 672 men could be identified as as having no cancer, so avoiding a, a biopsy after a negative MRI. So MRI is more likely to make a correct diagnosis using fewer biopsies in a mixed outpatient population. In fact, it's 12% more likely to make a correct diagnosis uh, than a systematic uh, biopsy. But you can see the major benefit is in men with prior negative biopsy. Now, the interesting thing is when MRI is positive, about 50% of men will have negative histology or insignificant cancer. So MRI is a step forward, but it's certainly not perfect at this time. There's a number of things that we need to think about when considering how to use MRI as a biomarker uh, to deliver the benefits of prostate cancer diagnosis. And one of these is who benefits from a comprehensive MRI approach. Well, it's not entirely clear from the MRI literature. There have been restricted inclusion criteria in most studies to men with, in, with uh, intermediate or high risk, uh, and generally excludes very low risk and very low risk, but also very high risk patients. Uh, in fact, you, many of you will be aware that there are inconsistencies between the NCCN and the EAU guidelines. So the question that's now being raised is, if you're not going to do a biopsy, should you also avoid an MRI? Well, let's see what the EAU guidelines say. The EAU guidelines say that the people who are most likely to benefit are those with a normal DRE and an elevated PSA. Uh, and for these men, you can use a risk calculator imaging, in other words, MRI or uh, additional biomarker tests. So if we take this patient, who is a 58-year-old uh, man, white Caucasian with an elevated PSA and a family history, you can see that the risk calculator advice uh, for biopsy is met with a clinically significant likelihood uh, rate of 13%. So he should deserve an MRI. And this is the data which which shows the value of using the Rotterdam risk calculator. So here we, we have uh, 200 biopsy naive men with, a, with 67 men with clinically significant disease. You can see the risk calculator says that 73 men don't need a MRI. 127 says that you, that the risk calculator says that 127 need an MRI. And in the people who don't need an MRI, you can see there are only four cancers 
And in the in those people who do need an MRI, there are 63 cancers. So what we can say is that using a risk calculator avoids an MRI and a biopsy in 37% of patients. However, it underdiagnoses 6% of men with clinically significant cancer. And of course, 6% is the is just above the background risk of prostate cancer in these uh, group of men. So this man certainly deserves uh, a MRI. Now here is the MRI in this patient. You can see that the DRE was false positive because it was abnormal on the right side. In fact, the abnormality here is on the left. This is typical glandular atrophy. Um, this is a negative MRI, PIRADS2. So if we were to biopsy this man, there is about an 8% chance that he would have clinically significant disease. But to detect these eight men, every man in this group would have to be biopsied. In other words, to diagnose one man with clinically significant disease after a negative MRI, 12 to 13 men will need a biopsy and of course be exposed to the side effects of the biopsy procedure. On the other hand, these people would be missed if you didn't do a biopsy. And within the people that would be missed would be three men with a uh, Gleason grade three or higher. So to minimize delays for diagnosis for these men, we should have a, a safety net of monitoring uh, according to local needs and uh, priorities. So if you look at the EAU guidelines, what do they say? Well, the EAU guidelines say that if an MRI is negative, i.e. pyrads 2 or less, and clinical suspicion is low, omit a biopsy. If an MRI is negative and the, and the suspicion is high, then perform a systematic biopsy. Uh, but what is low and what is high in a negative MRI situation? Well, if we look at the PSA density, you can see in this meta-analysis that if your PSA density is less than 0.2, you have less than 10% chance of clinically significant disease. So we could use a PSA density threshold of 0.2 in MRI negative cases. What about... So, it, so in fact, in this particular patient, you can see that we did perform a uh, multiparametric MRI. He was found not to be at high enough risk. And in fact, he avoided a biopsy and went on to a safety net regime. So what about PIRADS3 cases? We know that PIRADS3 cases occurs in about 15 to 16% of all MRI scans. And the data shows that the prevalence of clinically significant disease is about 18%. What do we do about indeterminate cases? Well, we can certainly do expert uh, peer review, MDT discussions, but we can also begin to use biomarkers to identify higher risk cases needing a biopsy. And again, we can use PSA density. On this occasion, you can see the PSA density threshold is lower. It's 0.1. So anybody less than 0.1 will have a low risk of clinically significant disease despite having a PIRADS3 case. And of course, PSA density also scales with the likelihood of clinically significant disease in positive cases also. So you can see increasing yields of clinically significant disease with PSA density, but everybody needs a biopsy with a positive MRI regardless. So, should we modify MRI positive and negative scans using volume normalized PSA? The answer is probably yes. So, for example, if you would only biopsy positive men, PS, uh, PIRADS 3 to 5, you can see that you would miss about 6% of clinically significant cancers. If you increase the threshold to 4 and 5, then you would miss more clinically significant cancers, more than 10%. So this would be unacceptable. If we did this method, which is this man and all of these men, then again, you can see how we can 
D, we can reduce the number of men um, where we miss uh, cancer uh, quite substantially, 5%, but we can see the number of biopsies avoided can be up to about 40%, so 38% here and 38% there. So what are the trade-offs between a targeted biopsy versus a systematic biopsy in men with a positive MRI? Well, if we were to do both systematic and targeted biopsies, the yield on average would be 44 men. So these 44 men would be diagnosed with clinically significant cancers, ISUP2 or above. If we were to omit a systematic biopsy, we would miss five men. So this is the added value of systematic biopsies to targeted biopsies in MRI positive cases, five out of a hundred. So what does the EAU guidelines say? Well, the EAU guidelines say that when MRI is positive, combine systematic and targeted biopsies. But in prior negative biopsy men, when an MRI is positive, only perform targeted biopsies. Of course, that means that biopsy yields, harms and benefits, will depend on the biopsy management strategies in positive and negative cases. So what we have established now is that we need to assess risk before and after an MRI to decide on biopsy need and the optimal strategy. And one way of visualizing this is to risk assess a patient into low, intermediate and high, and then to have low, intermediate, high and very high risk using MRI, and then develop a matrix on whether to biopsy or not to biopsy, depending on the combination of risk and, of course, on MRI findings. In fact, this has been done by Bozen uh, recently, where they biopsied men with uh, negative MRI scans and then with higher PSA densities and all positive men. And what they noticed, the total number of biopsies avoided increased when they adopted this new strategy. There were less clinically insignificant cancers detected, but there were the same rates of missed clinically significant cancers. You can see if this figure of 5, 6, 7% is fairly consistent across multiple studies. The real question is, if you apply this modified strategy, are the cancers that you miss within this 7% different to those if you only had a pyrides 3 to 5? So this is an important question that's not yet been addressed. So let's put it all together. This study recently evaluated the 4K score, MRI, the risk calculator, and PSA density, and established thresholds of the number of cancers that would be missed according to different thresholds. You can see this is a DCA analysis, and the Rotterdam risk calculator in this particular case is poorly calibrated. But let's see what they were able to achieve. What they showed on in this DC analysis was that strategy one and strategy two were the best strategies having the highest net benefit. So what is strategy one? Strategy one is a 4K score first with no biopsy and no MRI for low K scores and no biopsy for an intermediate no K, uh, 4K score if the MRI subsequently was negative. And this, you can see, would cost $1,000 per man in a group of men. Whereas biopsy strategy three was an MRI first with a biopsy for all positive findings and for negative MRI if PSA density was 
just point one or above. So not the strategy that we were suggesting, but a different strategy. And you can see this helps lower the cost by about a half when you compare to a 4K score. And of course, the cheapest strategy is this strategy, doing an, a Rotterdam risk calculator first with no biopsy and no MRI if the uh, risks are low, and only doing a biopsy for positive MRI findings, ignoring, of course, PSA density. And you can see that the cost was uh, $300. But the number of clinically insignificant, the number of cancers that were missed, increased to 12% compared to 2, 1 to 2%, sorry, 2 to 3% in strategy 1 and in strategy 3. So we're really honing in now on personalizing diagnosis using imaging biomarkers. When we talk about personalization, we're talking about pre-risk stratification, low, intermediate, and high risk, deciding whether a patient needs or does not need an MRI, what the MRI findings are, and then a recommendation based on MRI findings and risk stratification, and taking the clinical priorities into account, deciding on what is the optimal strategy of the combination of targeted biopsies and systematic biopsies. So here are my final concluding comments. We do need to use clinical biomarkers and risk calculators for patient selection and biopsy decision-making before and after an MRI. We need to tailor biopsy strategies according to clinical priorities and use MRI findings as a roadmap to target lesions. We need to understand that we will not find all clinically significant cancers immediately in both positive and negative cases, and we must have robust safety nets uh, for negative MRI scans or when you get a non-explanatory biopsy after a positive MRI. Clearly, we need end-to-end -end quality of the diagnostic chain with robust multidiscipline working. And I think that way we can make the whole enterprise of precision diagnosis much more likely to succeed in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.